May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear children of God, gathered in his house yet again to hear another Christmas story. But admittedly, the Christmas story that we're studying this morning isn't much of a story as we understand stories. It's more what I like to call the backstory to Christmas. It's St. John the Apostles and Evangelists' account of the birth of Jesus. But you need to understand that when John wrote his gospel lesson, like he did to many of the, the letters that he wrote, he was writing to an audience that considered themselves to be very enlightened. And so he was talking to people who liked to hear, if you want to say it, enlightening kind of thoughts. And for that reason, his, his thoughts are a little lofty, that we might say in some cases a little esoteric. But also because John was writing long after the other gospel writers had written their gospels and those had been disseminated among Christian churches, he chose to omit certain things that he knew they had already reported, while he also then chose to include things that he knew they had not included in their gospels. And that's why his gospel is, we might say, a little radically different from some of the other Gospels with which we're familiar, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So in, in this account that we've just read in John's Gospel, you'll notice that there were no angels, no shepherds watching over their flocks at night, no star in the sky, no wise men, no drama in, played out in, in Bethlehem. In fact, there, there really isn't much on the surface of John's account that would play on your emotions, that would evoke some uh, response from your, your heart or from your senses. His, as I said earlier, is a little bit more cerebral and, and, and perhaps we could say esoteric. But here's the genius of St. John. Now we'll, we'll give some credit to the Holy Spirit for inspiring these words, but this Holy Spirit is using John's gifts and, and John's vocabulary and John's way of thinking to communicate God's truth to us. But here's the genius of it. God, through John, chose some of the most simple, ordinary words. And, and when I tell you that, I, I, I don't know that there's a way to, to, to really emphasize it enough. But to say that even a first-year Greek student, if you've only been studying Greek for but a few months, you could read John's Gospel. You could read this opening chapter. The vocabulary is that simple. The structure is that simple you could understand it. He chose words that were simple, that even a child could understand. And yet through those simple words, he expresses the most profound thoughts but today we want to focus on the extraordinarily good news that John is privileged to reveal to us in those very simple, ordinary words. So, for the next few minutes, I, I just want you to let John engage, first of all, your mind and then your heart, ultimately your soul, as we study through these first 18 verses of the gospel that bears his name. Notice as we read through this and study through it that John begins with the account of creation. In just but a few sentences he talks about creation and then he gets into the fall into sin. He gets into the effects of that, that fall into sin and, and covers a few thousand years of history in a matter of a, a sentence or two and then tells us about John the Baptist and finally the coming of our Savior into the world. It's just condensed but he's got the whole thing all there in these first few verses. So listen to what John wrote. He said, in the beginning, so taking us all the way back to creation, was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, that's the Word, all things were made. Without Him, who is the Word, 
nothing was made that has been made. In him, who is the word, was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So, where was the Son of God when the world was created? John tells us he was right there. He was the Word of God. The verbal emanation of God's voice. That's the Word. That's the Son of God. The second person of the triune deity. And what was he doing? He was taking what was in the mind of God, and as God was speaking it, he was making it reality. He was making it come to life. And John says, he's so integral in that act of creation that unless the Word, this second person of God, had been actively involved in taking what was in the mind of God and bring it in into reality, nothing could have been brought into reality. And, and John then makes the statement that everything we see, everything that is real in this world, came into existence because the Word of God made it so. Now, I, I want you to think about that and all the implications it has for us, especially this morning. Think about what that means for you when we say that the Word of God, the Son of God, is the one who takes what is in the, the heart and the mind of God and makes it reality for us. Do you begin to understand how important this creation account is in our understanding of the entire scripture? There's little doubt as to why God records it as the very first thing in our Bibles. It's why our Bibles, like John's Gospel, begin the same way in the beginning. This is how God brings things into existence. He takes what's in his mind and the Son of God as the Word brings it out and makes it real for us. That's important. It's important for the way we understand everything else in the Bible. But not only does John leave it there, he goes on and, and tells us more. Now, you, I don't know how often you've heard me say this. Without grace, there is no Jesus. Without Jesus, there is no grace. Why? Because Jesus is the Son of God who takes what is in the heart and in the mind of God and makes it a reality for us. It, without Jesus, all that exists is this idea of grace in the heart and mind of God. But that does us no good. We have to have one who takes what is in the heart of God and in the mind of God and makes it our own, makes it real for us. So John tells us that the author of life and light is the one who is the Word of God. Again, he takes what is life, this, this concept of life and light, and he makes it a reality for us. It's interesting also that these are titles that Jesus later took for himself. In fulfillment of these words in a prophecy, of Isaiah's prophecy of Psalm 2, he says what? I am the light of the world. He, he tells Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. By the way, those are two statements that John the Apostle records later in this very same gospel. And yet, John reports that though it was a powerful light that could never be overcome by darkness, what happened? He said, there was also darkness in the world. Darkness, not of night, but a different kind of darkness. A darkness that cloaks and covers human hearts and minds. We read about that earlier when we read from Isaiah chapter 9. He talks about the people walking in darkness. Other translators say the people sitting in darkness or groping about in darkness. I don't even know if you can see this, it in the screen. I've tried to portray it. It's kind of hard to see people in the darkness, isn't it? 
I've, I've tried to demonstrate that, so you've got to strain a little bit. Oh, there are people in there, huh? Yeah, that's the point, see? That's the kind of darkness in which people lived. It, it, it's interesting that in one sentence, John talks, talks about the creation. In the very next sentence, he talks about the fall into sin and the effects of it. So, so what happens? Well, we've got people living in this darkness of unbelief, uh, the darkness of sin, which drags with it its very dear friend, death. And so they join the sit-in party. And, and people are cloaked in this darkness. We might say cloaked, covered, and smothered in this darkness of sin and, and death. This was and still remains the world's greatest catastrophe, its greatest tragedy, its greatest dilemma. But what John writes to reveal to us is what God did to address that condition of darkness that had cloaked, covered, and smothered the human heart and condition. And it's actually quite astounding. Because we might expect that having seen everything go wrong with creation, God would just wipe it all out and start over. And he could have. But he didn't. He didn't have to. Because God knew that the power of his grace was stronger than the darkness. That John says, right? The darkness has not overcome it. No, God sent his light into the darkness. That's what God did. And again, that's what John tells us later in one of his letters. He says, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. So he announces this through the prophets of the Old Testament. It's kind of like little star lights piercing the darkness of night all the way through until suddenly we get to the very last prophet, and that's the one John's going to talk about, this very last Old Testament prophet. Listen to what he says. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor a human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. So, the Word of God, who is the Son of God, the light and life of the world, was about to enter the fallen world, was about to enter the darkness. But just before he did, God sent his prophet, the last great Old Testament prophet named John, not the one who wrote the book, but the one we know as John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was sent, as John the Apostle tells us, to testify, to point to, to give witness to, that this one who was named Jesus really was the Word of God who brought light and life into the world. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the Apostle John would know this to be true about John the Baptist because, as is believed by many, he was first a disciple of John the Baptist. So he would have heard John preach and, and testify to these things. But finally, the one who is the true light of the world, the one who is the life of the world, entered the world. And that is how God addressed the darkness, by sending light into it. That's the greatest news ever. However, the people who were living, covered and smothered in the darkness of sin and death, John says, they didn't recognize him. They didn't even know who he was. They, 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 didn't, they didn't care. There could be several things that explain that. 
First of all, I, I was reminded of this many years ago when I went spelunking with uh, some teenagers. I took the youth group over to East Tennessee and we went spelunking in some of the caves. That means exploring caves for those of you who don't have heard the term spelunking. And our guide took us to a, an underground lake and there were fish in the lake. Now they could never figure out how the fish got there, though I had a few ideas of my own. But what they also reminded us of is because it's so dark down there, the fish are blind. So you know, how do you catch blind fish? I suppose the net would be the only way, but you know, a, a lure isn't gonna work on blind fish. But that situation is so similar to the one that John is describing here. When, when people, when human beings live in the darkness of sin and unbelief under that, that shroud of death for so long, they are blind. They are blind to spiritual truth. They can't see the light when it's standing right next to them. And that really describes Jesus' ministry. But, but it's even worse than that because John said, Jesus didn't just come into the world. He even came to those who were his own, the ones that God had chosen to be the cradle nation for the Savior, to bring the Savior into the world. But they had been in darkness for so long, they didn't even receive him. You see how powerful darkness is? It's just as, as Jesus would point out in, in the ninth chapter of this same gospel. They think they can see, but they're blind. Their hearts are covered. They're enshrouded, covered and smothered in the darkness of sin and unbelief and death. Now, we can't just skip over this truth. We have to first find ourselves in it. You see, with every new birth, with every new generation, people are naturally born into this world of blindness, into this world of darkness. And we're no exceptions. We were all born into the darkness. And at times, we still prove that we would rather live in the darkness than in the light. Why is that? Well, because frankly, let's be honest, some sins are just fun, aren't they? We just like committing some kinds of sins. And we call them our pet sins or whatever, but we just like, the, we, we, we entertain the sin. But, but every once in a while, we're tempted to commit some really bad ones, the ones even that we admit are really pretty rotten. And then what happens? We're afraid to enter into the light, why? Because we know what the light does. The light exposes. And the light is going to expose us for who we are and for the things we've done, thought, said, or felt. And so we become afraid of the light. We don't want, the sh out of fear, we, we don't want our shame and our guilt exposed. And so we cling to the darkness as cover. And I would say futilely so. But I think there's another reason why we're tempted to stay covered and cloaked in the darkness. It's because, well, misery loves company, right? When you're, when you're, you know, making a pet out of your sins, well, the other sinners in the darkness, they're not going to judge you. Why, it's all normal. That's just the way people do it, right? And, and so there's a certain, you feel, a, a, a false sense of safety in the company of fellow sinners. So there is no chance in our natural condition, that we would ever decide on our own to like, you know what, I think I'm just gonna go into God's light and see what happens. Not gonna happen. We wouldn't expose ourselves like that. Um, we don't choose to stand in the presence of God. We, we don't just simply decide we're gonna clean up our acts, you know, love God and be, be his children. It simply can't happen that way and yet and John says it with almost a certain amount of surprise right people don't see him they don't receive him and yet yet to all who did receive him to those who believed in his name he gave the right to become children of God children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will but born of God See, there are those who did receive the light. You might say, who had their eyes opened, right? Who saw the light. Who were they? 
the ones who believed in his name. But, but how did they come to have that? How, how can that be since we were all blinded and, and covered and smothered in the darkness of sin and death? Well, John, in congruence with the rest of Scripture, explains that to us. We, we were children of God. We weren't born of natural descent. In other words, we just weren't born into the light to, just to see it. We're not of a human decision. You know, we didn't decide to enter the light or a husband's will. We weren't forced into it by somebody else, but rather we were born of God. Now, how do you, how do you make sense of that? How did that happen? Like many things in the Christmas account, we can't explain miracles. We can simply proclaim them. In a Christmas carol that we sing, where shepherds lately knelt, there's a, there's a, a phrase in there explaining how we come to recognize Jesus as our Savior, and it's unasked, unforced, unearned. St. Augustine put it this way. He said, God makes the unwilling willing. Again, it's a, mirac a miracle. How do, you, how do you do that? Well, as I said, it's, it's not that, that you were asked to come into the... To, you didn't ask God, hey, hey, God, I'm in this darkness. Can I come into your light, the light of your, uh, of your son, and, and have life that he gives? It didn't happen. God didn't force you. He didn't put a flaming sword in your back and say, hey, you better get moving into the light. That didn't happen. And you certainly didn't barter with God. You didn't say, God, I'm sitting, I'm a poor, miserable sinner sitting here in this darkness of sin and death, and I just abhor it, and I would like to pay you to get into the light. I, I, I need some favor here. That didn't happen that way. And now what's... But somehow, somewhere along the line, you heard about this word who became flesh, who was the light and life of the world, who came into the world, and what happened? You believed it. And there's no explaining. How, how did that change happen? That's the miracle. And that's what John's explaining for us in these words. It's a miracle. God gives that gift to us, but what's the result of it? Well, now rather than running away from God, you run to him as your refuge. Rather than trying to cover yourself futilely in the darkness, you willingly come out into the open and confess your sins to receive God's mercy and forgiveness. Rather than remaining chained up in fear and the shame and the darkness, you've been set free from that prison and now live in the glorious freedom of the children of God. And then finally John tells us how this word from creation, this second person of God, became human. He said, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. I, I love these words because John's words here are much like the words of the angel Gabriel to Mary. He doesn't explain the miracle. He doesn't tell us how it happened. He simply proclaims it. The one who was with God from eternity, the one who is the word of God, who was at the beginning, who was responsible for bringing everything that was in the heart and mind of God into reality for us, has now gone one more step and taken on human body and soul in, in infant form to now reveal our very real God to us. And John says what? As, a, as an apostle, as a disciple of Jesus, he could say, we've seen his glory. John was there as an eyewitness of Jesus' ministry. The glory of who? The one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Isn't that just extraordinary? All those sinners clung to their, their darkness, although they, they, we wanted to cloak ourselves covered and smothered in sin and, and, and be just unwillingly married to, to death. God did the opposite of what we deserved. He did a most unimaginable, almost unthinkable thing. Instead of wiping us out and condemning us, he comes in and joins us in the darkness, bringing his light with him. Think about that. The eternal almighty God rather than wiping us out, rather than, than burning us up in his anger, 
in his grace and in his mercy, comes down in the form of a little baby, placed in the arms in the lap of Mary, to sit down with us in that darkness. Jesus came and rubbed elbows with sinners. Never engaging in sin himself, but not afraid to put his arms around sinners. So that what? So that eventually he would grow up to do what? To absorb all of that sin in himself. So that God would punish him. Destroy him on the cross. So that he could then also be subject to death and die the death we deserved. But also, so that with his almighty power, he could destroy death by his rising from the dead, proving himself to be for time and eternity the light and the life of the world. God did this for you. This is the grace of God that the Son of God has brought to life for you. He took that attitude and that, that love in the heart of God and the plan that was in God's mind and he took on human flesh and made it real for you and me. And so John concludes his letter, or his first chapter in these ways. That John, the Baptist, testified concerning him, who is Jesus. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. You get that? It sounds like double talk, but it's really not. Jesus, who comes after me, who's John, in other words, Jesus was born after I was, is becoming even greater than I am. And we know that to be true in the ministry and the miracles of Jesus. He certainly did. And then John explains why that was. Because Jesus is before me. He's existed long before me. John the Baptist is simply saying Jesus is God. And out of Jesus' fullness, we all have received grace in place of grace already given. It's another way of saying that when you thought you had enough grace, God just smothered you with even more grace. The law was given through Moses. God brought the law into a visible reality to us through Moses, the great prophet. But God made his grace real to us through Jesus Christ, who is the word of God, through whom all things were made, without whom nothing was made. So to have grace, what do we have to have? Jesus. Without Jesus, there would be no grace except just as a concept in the mind of God. And that, dear friends, is the story of how God made or took ordinary, simple words and used them to express the most extraordinarily good news. God's grace is a reality for you. His name is Jesus. Now you think about what that means for you. Of all the stuff that can go wrong in this life, and it does, because we live in a world smothered and covered in darkness. Of all the things that we still battle internally, because you know, we still live with sin in our hearts and the darkness that, that fights the light that the Holy Spirit has put there. Amid all of that terrible stuff, you can know this for sure. None of it happens, none of it is allowed to happen because God doesn't love you. That can't be the reason, can it? You know from this chapter in John's Gospel that your Father in Heaven absolutely loves you because through His Son He made His love for you a reality for you. And in his son, Jesus, you think now of all the things that are reality, real things for you. Jesus, we, we often say he came to produce righteousness or to give forgiveness. That's true. We can say it that way. But it's true that we understand it this way. Jesus is our righteousness. He is our forgiveness. Therefore, he is our peace. He is our joy and our hope just as he most certainly is God's grace 
made real for us. So if you possess Jesus, you have everything. And brothers and sisters, through his word and sacraments, the Holy Spirit has enlightened you with Jesus. You have everything. And that's why this is a very merry Christmas. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your role in creation, your role really in bringing everything into existence, especially your life, light, God's grace for sinners such as we who groped about in darkness. We ask that as we contemplate and meditate on your birth and, and everything that means for us, you will so fill our hearts with joy and peace, not just for a day or two, but for the rest of our lives. Any day, we can pick up these words and read them and see how much you have done for us, how much you have become for us. We thank you that through faith, we possess you, but you also have taken hold of us. We ask you to bless us in your name. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.